this morning to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Sadly to me, I guess I always feel a little bit sad. We're coming to the end of this series today. So we've studied through the books of 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to conclude today. It's going to be a very, very uh, um, positive note as we finish up this book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll look at verses 16 through 18 here in just a moment. You know, parenting uh, has got to be one of the most interesting and amazing experiences in human life. So much that's learned through it for the parents as well as the children. Um, it's very revealing to me when I listen to different perspectives in parenting. There are those who can't wait until the kids are out of the house. Talk to them a lot. It seems to be a fairly worldly philosophy in my opinion. Those parents are focused on themselves and the inconvenience that it is to have their lives interrupted by children. Kind of sad. Uh, but that's the, the general... Uh, the general theme that comes out of people that think that way. Then there are those on the opposite end of the spectrum who are so very sad because their children are growing so fast and they just want those cute little babies to stay cute little babies forever. They are also focused on themselves and on what they personally get out of having little children who are reliant on them. But there's another perspective um, that, that I believe is the right perspective. I know it's the right perspective, and that is this. Facilitating growth with the focus on preparing those children and moving them intentionally towards responsibility and maturity. That's what biblical parenting should look like. It's always fun to, <clears throat> to watch our children and grandchildren, if you have those, grow. Um, it's exciting to see that. They get so excited about their progress. Um, and and for, for children, as they grow and as they learn and experience, every experience towards adulthood and maturity is an amazing accomplishment for them. And I get so much joy out of my children uh, coming and excitedly telling me something that they discovered. Uh, or some new thing that they started doing as a result of growth and maturity in their lives. As they get older, it's like watching a, a tree grow to a, a beautiful and fruitful state right before your eyes. It's a fantastic experience as a parent. Now, the proper goal of true parenting, of truly proper parenting, is to produce and raise children into mature, productive fruitful adults who will be diligent contributors to society and who will operate with unsullied character and integrity. The goal for parents should be to bring that to pass as soon as possible. It's unfortunate, but being a mature adult is something that rather than being aspired to in our society is frequently resisted and it is stayed off for as long as possible. And even then, adult, adult behavior is avoided as often as possible as well. Um, I know a number of people, in fact, I was just in a store yesterday, and I was observing this lady who had some children, and she was wearing a, a shirt that said, I'm taking a break from adulting today. And that's kind of one of the little, uh, one of the little catchy things that people are, are wearing or, or, uh, or broadcasting around them. They think it's funny. Being a mature adult, however, is a very desirable rewarding and gratifying destination. It's also gratifying to watch believers grow in Christ. And the concepts and the principles are identical. In fact, the most sincere parenting that can be done is also captured in this context. I especially enjoy watching someone gain victory over some sin. See them come to embrace some profound truth from God's word that was previously not known to them. Or observe them excitedly serving the Lord in some way. It is so rewarding and so fulfilling for me to see that. <clears throat> and while all the changes may not be as visible as we grow older in the Lord, Christian growth, this is my theme this morning, Christian growth should continue until the day that we are with Jesus. We should never be 
steady state in our lives where we are just in maintenance mode as believers, we should never be stagnant. I'm sad to say that I've known some people, some believers who are in their 70s who have not grown spiritually much, if at all. While I've known some in their youth who took off and have flourished greatly. That's a wonderful thing to see. Well, as Paul wraps up our letter here, his second letter to these new Thessalonian believers, he offers his fourth prayer for them just in the three chapters of this letter. And he says this, first, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, Paul's frequent prayers through his epistles and particularly through this one show that we must depend on the Lord's grace and strength in every situation, both for our own growth and for the growth of others that we care about. Also, God's grace and love are recurring themes in Paul's prayers. As you study back through the prayers we've seen in 2 Thessalonians, and as you look through other prayers that he shares throughout his various letters, you see that as a constant theme that he comes back to, the love of God and the grace of God. Always see those. Those qualities are the prime motivation we're going to see this morning for spiritual growth. Now, while it's not comprehensive, Paul's concluding prayer here read, and his authenticating signature to this letter gives us a short pattern for Christian growth. That's what we'll talk about here today. To grow in Christ, seek his peace in every situation. Seek his presence always. Submit to his word as your authority and saturate your life with his grace. Those are four very clear points that he makes in his prayer here. And so, first of all, to grow in Christ, seek his peace in every situation. And I want to emphasize this from the very start. It's easy, maybe going through your daily Bible reading or through your personal study, to come to uh, a, a conclusion at the end of a letter like this. And you just see, um, you almost just see it as kind of a cursory ending to the letter and not very much to be gained from it, folks. Every word of God is inspired. And so we have this preserved for us in God's word. It is important. It is inspired by God, and there is much to learn from it. So don't dismiss it in that way. To grow in Christ, first of all, seek his peace in every situation. As Paul leads into this prayer in verse 16, he says this. Now remember, this is all with a view towards what does Christian growth and Christian maturity look like. How does a mature spiritual adult behave, all right? Now, the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Thessalonians were going through persecution. They were going through intense persecution. They were battling false teaching, and they were dealing with unruly church members. Those are all themes that we've seen throughout this book. Each of those situations had the potential to create tension and strife in that local church. And the same thing is true of local churches today. In this battle, Paul um, prays for the reality of the Lord's peace to continually be present in every circumstance. While his prayer has an individual application for sure, the primary application in this context is for the church to experience God's peace. Don't, don't miss that. This is the only time that the phrase, the Lord of peace, occurs in the New Testament. All right? It's specifically referring to Jesus. You can see that through the context here. More often, the expression throughout the New Testament is the God of peace. That refers to God the Father. Did you know the, the Holy Spirit is also the source of peace, which is part of the fruit that he produces in people's lives? If you read through the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, you see peace very clearly noted in there. That's something that should be produced as we reflect the character of God as we grow ourselves. 
And so all three members of the Trinity are the source of peace for believers. What the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us has helped to bring that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, God himself as the Father brings this into our lives. And as the Holy Spirit operates in our lives, we ought to see this clearly prevailing as well. And so the Hebrew concept of shalom or peace, which was behind Paul's thinking here, referred not just to the absence of strife but to overall well-being and maturity, peace really has three dimensions. I want to break this down for you real quick. First of all, peace with God is a gift that comes through Jesus Christ, through sanctification by faith, and through sanctification as we walk before, uh, I'm sorry, justification by faith, and sanctification as we walk before the Lord in purity. In other words, that there's a definite beginning to it, and then it is a constant that ought to be seen throughout our lives. By birth, and because of our sin, we are all hostile towards God. We are in a state, the Bible says, of enmity. That was an old English word that spoke of the deepest seated hatred that can, uh, that can be possessed by anyone. It's the natural state of man's heart against God in the sinful condition. We are alienated from God in our thoughts and in our deeds. And so not just how we already are. In our natural state but the thoughts that we have and then all of our actions we it, it alienates us from God separates us brings an unspannable gulf between us and God but by his amazing grace Christ made peace with God for us through the blood of his cross and so Paul states this in Romans 5 and 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. People outside of Christ may have a false sense of peace because they think too highly of themselves and too lowly of God, who is absolutely holy. There are many who assume that their good works will get them into heaven. Uh, after all, they're not mass murderers and they're not rapists, right? They're basically good people, right? <laughs> There have also always been plenty of false prophets who tell people these words, peace, peace, according to Jeremiah. But Isaiah declares this, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no real peace that's there. Thomas Watson, um, a Puritan writer, put it this way, the seeming peace that a sinner has is not from the knowledge of his happiness, but from the ignorance of his danger. So peace with God, it is a gift that comes first through justification by faith in Christ. That's what ends the war. It brings a, a peace treaty in a sense so that we are able to get along with God. Also, though, peace comes through sanctification by the Holy Spirit. Back in 1 Thessalonians, when we studied that, chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul also prayed there. And the very God of peace sanctify you Holy. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, we cannot enjoy peace with God while we're living in known disobedience to his commands. It can't happen. David was clearly a believer when he sinned with Bathsheba and then had her husband murdered. It was Obvious, it was blatant, it was open sin, but he was a believer in the Lord. But in Psalm 38, he, he goes on um, verse after verse describing the turmoil and describing the lack of peace that engulfed him because of his sin. Again, Thomas Watson graphically puts it this way, you may as well suck health out of poison as peace out of sin. If you have... If you would have peace, make war with sin. We're saying that to grow in Christ, seek his peace in every situation. That's what Paul said here. First, this happens by recognizing that peace is something that comes from God as we are made right with him. And then as we are sanctified or made holy by vehemently eradicating sin from our lives. Further, as we delve into what peace is all about, peace with God also results in peace with other believers. 
even if they're very different than you are. So remember the concept here that the theme Paul is writing to a local church. And so again, this may have personal and individual application, and it should as church members. We should all be applying it. But in a corporate sense, peace with God results in peace with other believers, and it results in a peaceful church. Paul spoke of the miraculous reconciliation between Jews and Gentiles that took place in churches in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14, saying this. He said, for he is our peace who hath made both one. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles there. And he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That was an amazing concept. You have to understand a little bit about the Jewish culture to get what he's really driving at. The wall of partition that he was talking about in real time, in real life, it was a dividing wall that was a chest high wall in the temple courtyard that divided the court of the Gentiles from the court of the Jews. The Gentiles were not allowed to cross that barrier and go to where the Jews were at. They couldn't get that close to the temple. There was a sign on that wall warning Gentiles that if they ventured beyond this point, they were responsible for their own deaths. But in Christ, that barrier, that wall of partition is broken down. So that in Jesus Christ's churches, according to Colossians 3.11, it says there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. There is a unity that takes place. God's truth, taken in its purity and unperverted by man, lays all prejudices and all divisions at the foot of the cross and, and leaves us all standing equal before God. True biblical Christianity has a civilizing effect on people. And it has a civilizing effect on cultures that cannot be seen or known anywhere else. It elevates all people, regardless of race, regardless of gender, to the same standing before God, and it's designed to bring peace. But even though Christ is our peace, peace among believers is not automatic, is it? Because of our different personalities, because of our different backgrounds, because of our different perspectives, and because of residual sin in our hearts, we need constantly to work at peaceful relationships with one another. Paul's command, which we studied last week, for the church to discipline unruly brethren who refused to work could have resulted in discord in that church. As people who were friends or relatives of the disciplined members may have come to their defense. And so it's understandable why Paul immediately follows it up with this prayer for peace within that church. Paul's approach wasn't to try and achieve peace by avoiding confrontation with sin. He said, deal with it, deal with it head on. It would have resulted in far bigger and more catastrophic problems later on if they would have avoided the sin. Rather, his approach was to deal with sin in a spirit-led manner and then pray for the Lord's peace to be experienced even in those difficult circumstances. I've seen believers who avoid conflicts with other believers by just moving on to another church because there's problems that they have with somebody else. Sometimes after repeated conflicts, they become so disillusioned that they just drop out altogether. I've also seen marriages where the husband and wife allow tension to build up through the years without working at resolving conflict in God's way. I've seen pastors who dodge conflict by not confronting sinning members, but dodging conflict without dealing with sin never results in lasting peace. We should do all that we can, folks. So don't, don't take me wrong. We should do all that we can to seek peace with others. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18 tells us that. But we can't do that by glossing over sin or by glossing over major doctrinal errors. On the other hand, those who go to the opposite extreme are no more right. They bring constant conflict over things that really don't matter biblically. Either of those are clear illustrations of someone 
who is not growing. Do you understand that today? Paul's emphasis here, the, the, the overall broad concept that he's laying out for us in his prayer is the emphasis on growth to maturity. And a person who evidences a lack of peace in their lives or a lack of ability to have peace with others is not growing spiritually. I said that to grow, seek peace from the Lord in every situation. Seek the Lord's peace. Peace is a gift that comes through trusting in Christ and then walking in a sanctified manner before the Lord. Peace with God will result in peace with other believers. And then next, as we examine what it means to have peace, Peace with God also results in inner peace, even in difficult situations. I hope that you regularly apply Paul's prescription for anxiety. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Listen to what he said. Be careful for nothing. The word careful, it means anxious, right? Anxiety. Everybody's got anxiety today, right? Uh, it's, these uh, these um uh, diagnosed uh, mental disorders and behavioral health issues. Everybody's got anxiety. Be anxious for nothing, Paul says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, now listen to it, all right? If you do that, you let your requests be made known to God when you find yourself in an anxious situation, and you do it with thanksgiving, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, don't forget the thanksgiving part there that he talks about. Even though you may not feel thankful for a trial, you can thank God by faith that he'll work it together for your good somehow. Right? Thankful prayer results in inner peace, even in the midst of difficult trials. Because it sees beyond the immediate circumstance, it sees the bigger picture. That's what we were talking about this morning as we studied the life of David. That takes a mature perspective, doesn't it? So grow in Christ. Seek peace with God through faith in Jesus' shed blood and by turning to all known sins. Seek peace with others, not by avoiding conflicts, but by working through them in a godly manner. And seek inner peace. Through thankful prayer, even in difficult situations. All right? So, prescription for maturity, point number one was, he says, the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. Secondly, to grow in Christ, seek his presence every day. Seek his presence constantly, Lord. You might miss it if you read quickly through this passage, but he says, the Lord be with you all. The Lord be with you all. The Lord has all, already promised to be with us always in the Great Commission. But Paul prays for this here to underscore what should characterize our lives if we're truly growing. And that is a growing presence of the Lord in our lives. A growing presence of the Lord. The Bible doctrine is very plain now that the Lord indwells those who believe in him. So his presence will be there. But Paul's praying for us to know in experience the fact of his indwelling presence. He dwells in every believer, but we need daily to experience that reality. Note three truths about this. Experiencing Christ's presence is essential for the journey towards heaven. It is. It's what life is all about, folks. In Exodus chapter 33, after the incident with the golden calf, remember they're at Mount Sinai, Moses is up in the mountain, he's receiving the law of God for 40 days, the people are all down there, and even though they could see God's presence right there, and Moses on top of the mountain, oh, we don't know what happened to Moses, and, and we need a God to worship, so they make this golden calf. And they start dancing around it, all kinds of immorality ensues, <coughs> and Moses comes down and he sees that. And so, they had that incident, and the Lord told Moses to continue on towards the land of Canaan after that. But the Lord said this, I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. God's angry. He's upset. Rightly so. He's broken his law, even as he gave it. 
Spirit breaking in blocks. And so God's statement there is a powerful one. I won't go with you. Go ahead and go on up, and I won't go with you. But Moses, who spoke with the Lord face to face, just a couple of verses prior to that, pled with God, and he said this, If your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. He goes on, he boldly asks the Lord, Take it a step further, Lord, show me your glory. You know, from the Garden of Eden, all the way to eternity future, at the end of the book of Revelation, when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, the theme of the Bible is God's presence with his people. Friends, the Bible tells us very plainly that the local church is God's temple where his presence dwells. What distinguishes the church from every other secular assembly is the presence of God in our midst. But do we really experience this? Do we really experience it? We ought to. We should have a sense of holy awe when we meet together because the living God is here in our midst. It should be our prayer all throughout the week to prepare us for the time when we'll come together and know the Lord's presence. And it's what we should experience as we come with our hearts, minds, and bodies prepared to meet with the Lord and his people. The Lord be with you all says the presence of God is what he's talking about and we can further say about that that Christ's presence cannot be experienced when we harbor sin in our hearts it can't be this is true both individually and it's true as a church of course we would never sin if we were really cognizant that God is with us we wouldn't <laughs> when David sinned with Bathsheba, and finally came to repentance, he cried out and said this, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, we understand that we don't lose our salvation if we sin. And the Bible teaches very, very plainly, Jesus himself said this, that when a person comes to faith in him, that the Father places them into his hand, no man, nothing, can pluck us out of his hand. And so we understand that the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is a permanent thing at the point of salvation. Our eternal security is very clearly laid out in Scripture. But we certainly forfeit the experience of the Lord's presence, the experience of it. If we harbor known sin in our hearts, if we have bitterness towards those who have wronged us, or if we have not asked forgiveness and sought to restore relationships when we have wronged others, or we're allowing sin to remain and continue, or any other myriad of things that I could uh, list for you this morning, we will not experience God's presence in this church. We understand that. If you look in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus very clearly came and warned those churches that he addressed I'm not going to walk in the midst of you anymore. You guys don't straighten this stuff up. And so there was a very clear warning that was given to churches. And there's a very clear warning as well to us as individuals. If we don't deal with known sin, we'll not experience God's presence as a church. We'll not experience God's presence in our homes. We'll not experience God's presence in our personal lives. Don't let sin rob you of experiencing Christ's presence. It's one of the clear themes of the Bible in walking to spiritual maturity is to know a growing understanding and experience of God's presence in your life. Christ's presence, so we said Christ's um, presence cannot be experienced when we harbor sin in our hearts. On the flip side, Christ's presence should be experienced both individually and corporately. It should be constant. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul reflects on a powerful promise of the Lord. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. At the end of Paul's life, when he faced execution, and he talked about how everyone had deserted him, he wrote this in 2 Timothy 4.17. Nevertheless, 
the Lord stood with you and strengthened you. We are so blessed to enjoy these promises no matter what we experience. But remember that Paul's writing to a church, and so it's true on a personal level, but Paul's writing to a church, and this is really to be understood in a church context. One of the most powerful promises that Jesus made to his church before he left this earth was when he said in the Great Commission, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. David Livingstone, missionary to Africa, he suffered incredible hardships taking the, the gospel into the uncharted heart of the African continent. He relied on that promise. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. David wrote this. On those words, I staked everything. And they never failed. John Patton, who encountered many life-threatening dangers as he took the gospel to the cannibal peoples of the New Hebrides Islands, lost his wife and lost his children in the process, not in the sense of them leaving him, but they died. He clung to that promise. I am with you always. As the source of his strength, as attempts on his life were made on a nearly daily basis, he said this. This is from his autobiography. I was fully persuaded that my God had placed me there and would protect me till my allotted task was finished. Looking up in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left all in his hands and felt immortal till my work was done. Trials and hairbreadth escapes strengthened my faith and seemed only to nerve me for more that was to follow and they did tread swiftly upon each other's heels. Without that abiding consciousness of the presence and the power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing in all the world could have preserved me from losing my reason and perishing miserably. His words, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, became so real to me that it would not have startled me to behold him as Stephen did, gazing down upon the sea. I felt his supporting power, as did St. Paul, when he cried, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It is the sober truth, and it comes back to me sweetly after 20 years now, that I had my dearest and nearest glimpses of my blessed Lord in those dread moments when musket, club, or spear was being leveled at my life. Oh, the bliss of living and enduring as seeing him who is invisible. As a church, we need to experience God's presence in our midst. Anything less is just going through the motions. And we can't afford to go through the motions. Does anybody here want to be just a part of some religious facade? I don't want to be. I want to be involved in a church where God's presence is, exper is, is experienced, where it's expected, where it's known, where it's continually sought. Paul said that when an unbeliever comes into our assembly, in 1 Corinthians 14, 25, the result should be that as God <laughs> deals with him, the secrets of his heart are made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. My prayer is that we won't just run through some rituals each week, but that God will show up and everyone will know that he is in us and among us of a truth. And so to grow in Christ, seek his peace in every situation. Seek his presence every day. Thirdly, to grow in Christ Submit to his word as your authority in life. Look at what he says in verse 17. <laughs> the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. You know, Paul often dictated his letters to a scribe who would write for him. Frequently he would do that. And now, at this point in the letter, as he closes, he takes the quill. And he writes the rest of the letter in his own hand to authenticate that this letter was truly from him. Now that was necessary 
because the Thessalonian church had already received a letter claiming to be from Paul that was spreading, spreading false teaching. You remember that? Back in chapter 2 and verse 2, he referenced that. He talked about letters as from us. And he said they weren't from us at all. And so this is much more than a personal note here to end the letter. This letter was a weapon in the war against heresy. That war continues today, by the way. False prophets today in charismatic churches claim on a regular basis to have revelations from God that are on par with or even override scripture. The Roman Catholic Church and many others have traditions that they elevate over scripture. But the scriptures are our only authority in matters of faith and practice. Make sure, make sure to compare every teaching of churches, uh, anything that you hear against God's authoritative word. No one has authority that even remotely resembles that of Christ and the apostles through whom he spoke. To despise the word of the Lord is to despise the Lord of the word and to disregard his authority. Friends, submission to God's word is our only compass in this confused and rebellious world to keep us charted properly in life. How do we know that abortion is wrong? We know because God's word reveals that he is the giver of life and that every person is created in his image. How do we know that homosexual behavior is sin? We know because God's word clearly spells that out over and over again. God's word, not modern opinions is our only guide. The same applies to every other moral and ethical issue that we face in this world that has rejected God's word of truth. To submit to God's word, you need to know his word by continually reading it, studying it, and applying it. To apply it correctly, you need to first interpret it correctly, and it is to be interpreted literally. To grow in your Christian walk, submit all of your life to all of God's word, or you'll just find yourself carried along by this godless culture. And finally, fourthly, as we talk about what it is to grow in him, to grow in Christ, which is the theme of all of Paul's writings and the theme of our church ministry as well, saturate your life with his grace. Saturate your life with his grace. Look how he closes. The grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This closing verse is identical with 1 Thessalonians 5.28, except for the addition of the word all. And I think it's important that Paul puts that word all, be with you all here. That includes even the disorderly and unruly that he had just written to earlier in the chapter. They need the Lord's grace too. The entire church needs the Lord's grace to deal with persecution, to deal with false teaching, to deal with the unruly members. Don't just gloss over these important closing words, friends. If this is the small amount here, these last couple of statements, if this is the small amount that Paul himself always took it upon himself to write in his own hand, it is notable that he emphasizes this as his main theme. For Paul, there is no experience apart from the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace. That was everything to him. Let me share a couple of very brief thoughts here about God's grace and what it means. First of all, this will make sense here in a minute, but both legalism and licentiousness are enemies of God's grace. Legalism is the teaching that human righteousness and keeping the law has to be somehow offered and produced before God to bring about salvation. That is directly opposed to the Bible's teaching about God's grace, which is completely unearned, and it is freely offered by God. Neither you nor I can ever do anything to appease God's demand for justice since we have broken his law. Only a proper payment in the form of Jesus Christ, undeserved, 
pure spotless blood will work. On the other hand of the spectrum, permissiveness and carelessness in the area of sin in the lives of God's people is a stark enemy of God's grace. Both extremes are based in human flesh, whether it's human attempts to produce righteousness to give to God for salvation, or whether it's humans giving in to sin and, uh, and not being holy in their walk with God. God's grace operates through the Holy Spirit, changing our hearts, giving us the desire to please and obey Him. Jesus Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions that very specifically here in that way. And so his grace, it leads to submitting to his lordship over every area of your life. God's grace does not give us the freedom to sin. Rather, it frees us from sin. What else do we know about God's grace? Well, in our context here, God's grace in the gospel is the motivation for holiness and for serving the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, Paul wrote this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now Paul was a great man, but he understood that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. I was not going to allow his grace to, to be pointless or to be empty in my life. It wasn't going to be in vain. He invested that in me. And so he says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. He would later write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul usually begins and ends his letters by invoking God's grace on the readers, which was more than just a formula. And it was more than just a formality. Paul never got over the wonder that as the chief of sinners, he found God's undeserved grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. And neither should you ever get over it. It's especially true of those of us from Christian homes. You know, it was God's grace that gave me Christian parents who loved me, who shared the gospel with me, who taught me the ways of the Lord. And it was His grace that convicted my heart of sin, opened my eyes to the love of the Lord Jesus, saved me from trusting in my own righteousness. Friends, bathe yourselves daily in the Lord's abundant grace, so that you're motivated to obey and serve Him. And further, I'll say this about God's grace, that God's grace shown to you should flow through you to others. If you have experienced the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel, you are now a channel for that grace to flow to other sinners. With the self-righteous who think that they're good enough, to get into heaven. You may need to preach the law to them, as Jesus did to the Pharisees, but with the broken who are burdened with their sin and guilt, Jesus always extended grace, and so should we. He invites all sinners, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The almost final verse of the Bible, Revelation twenty-two seventeen invites and the spirit and the bride and we understand through the scripture that the bride is one of the terms that's used for jesus churches the spirit and the bride say come come there's an invitation there there is the the flowing of god's grace through them to needy people and an invitation for them to come to the lord as well the spirit and the bride say come and let him that hear it Say, come. So you listen. You hear about God's grace. Your responsibility is to invite others and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And the very last verse of the Bible says this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. 
Not only should we extend the grace of the gospel to other people, but also those who have experienced God's grace should be gracious themselves in their character towards difficult people and towards people who are enslaved to sin. It grieves me. I want you to understand my context here, but it grieves me when I see Christians being harsh and ugly and condemning, whether towards other believers or towards those in the world. Yeah, we need to hold the line on God's absolute moral standards. We understand that. God's truth is not to be compromised. Yes, we need to clearly define and preach holiness of life. But if it were not for God's grace, we'd all be violating those standards. Everyone we meet has difficult struggles of some sort, and so everyone needs God's grace. And you are the channel for that grace to flow to them. In conclusion, I want to tell you, somebody once said that, that a rut is a grave that has the ends knocked out, all right? It's possible that some of you find yourselves in a spiritual rut today, but the Lord wants you to be growing. I don't know if I can pronounce this guy's name, but I found this quote that I want to share with you, Alexander um, Solzhenitsyn. He's a Russian writer who survived the gulag, and he wrote this. He said, the meaning of earthly existence lies not, as we have grown used to thinking, in prospering, but in the development of the soul. That's, that's the conclusion that he came to after his time in the gulag. The Lord wants you to develop your soul by seeking his peace in every situation, by seeking his presence every day. By submitting to his word as your absolute authority and by saturating your life with his amazing grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. I thank you for the time of fellowship we can share together as we, as we meet here, not just with one another, but with your presence here amongst us. We come trusting that, that throughout this morning time as we've opened your word and considered it and tried to make application that... Uh, that the Holy Spirit is dealing with hearts, and we know after the pattern of Revelation chapter 1 that, that you say that you're walking in the midst of your churches. And so this morning, we trust that, that the presence of the Lord Jesus has been here as well, walking up and down the aisles and, and observing and looking at and evaluating each life. And I pray that as a church, you'll find us in a state of growth. And I pray that as individuals, you won't find anyone who is stagnating here, that's in a rut, but that through the application of these very simple principles, and yet very powerful things that Paul said at the conclusion of his very last letter to the Thessalonian church before he would leave this earth, I pray that you would drive those truths home to us as the, the constants that would be abiding in our lives as we seek to grow and walk with you. Lord, let us be a a church that's constantly focused on the need for personal growth, uh, for developing the soul through these uh, core competencies here that we've studied through today. Uh, we trust that you'll continue to deal with hearts as we go into this invitation time. And Lord, if there's a person here who has just this morning come to the comprehension and realization of the gospel and what it really means and the way that the grace of Jesus Christ can change them and can bring forgiveness and salvation, I pray that you'd find that person on their knees before you today in absolute surrender. And I pray for each one that's a believer here today that, uh, that you would also bring us all to our knees as we, as we seek, Lord, to enjoy your presence in an ever-increasing way in our lives. I pray that we'll be fully surrendered to you. The work this morning to call people, whether to salvation or to the ministry uh, or to holiness, in whatever respect they need to be challenged. We trust you to do that at this time. In Jesus' name.